Hello, this is Professor Gregory. Welcome to the video lessons that accompany my textbook, Formal Logic. These videos complement the reading and help to introduce you to the concepts, definitions, and methods we'll be applying throughout the text and in the classroom. As you may know, this is a text on formal symbolic logic, and here on the screen you can see some examples of the symbolic languages you'll be learning and using throughout the lessons. Before we get to all of that, however, Chapter 1, The Informal Introduction, will familiarize you with logic and some of its key concepts. So first of all, what is logic? There are many ways we might define logic, as a system of thinking or rules for reasoning or so forth. Here we'll characterize logic as the study of argument, specifically the study of criteria for distinguishing successful from unsuccessful arguments and the study of methods for applying those criteria. Now by argument, we do not mean a shouting match or an angry dispute, although those sorts of arguments can sometimes involve the kinds of arguments we'll be interested in. Instead, we mean something a little more simple, just a set of statements, some of which, the premises, are supposed to support or give reasons for the remaining statement, the conclusion. In a successful argument, the premises genuinely do support the conclusion. But what do we mean by genuine support? Well, genuine support requires the probable or guaranteed preservation of truth from premises to conclusion. The idea being that if we take the premises to be true, then we can be sure or be reasonably confident that the conclusion is also true. If this idea doesn't make perfect sense right now, don't worry too much about it. We'll be talking about it again and again and we'll make it more precise as we go along. Logic will also include the study of related properties such as consistency, equivalence, logical truth, and so on. And last, but certainly not least, logic is the key to a world of wonder. It also helps to be clear about what we do not include in logic. Logic is not the study of persuasion and manipulative rhetorical devices. By successful argument, we do not mean merely persuasive argument. We often try to persuade people to believe things or do things that we want them to do, whether there are good reasons for them or not. And we don't merely mean success in that endeavor. Human fallibility and manipulative rhetoric lead people to accept poor reasoning and to reject good reasoning. This very distinction between what we merely accept and what's actually good reasoning suggests that there's some criteria other than mere persuasiveness that we need to pay attention to. Remember, in a successful argument, if the premises are true, then the conclusion is either guaranteed to be true or likely to be true. Again, we are going to spend some time making this concept more precise so that we can study it systematically. Why should you study logic? Well, logic has intrinsic value. It's good in itself. If you enjoy learning things, then learning logic is a good. If you enjoy abstract structures and analytic elegance, then again, you'll find this in logic and you'll find it valuable in itself. Also, if you just really enjoy puzzles and figuring things out, we'll be doing a lot of that here, so the logic is good in itself. But logic is also good for things. It has instrumental value. In particular, it can improve your abstract, critical, and analytic reasoning skills. It can make you a better critical thinker. It can definitely improve your writing, reading, and speaking skills. And these can be applied in other areas of life, in your other classes, in your work, and so forth. Now, much of what we'll be doing won't be directly associated with reading writing or speaking that you might do in other classes or in your eventual professional life. It'll be much more abstract than that. And there'll even be portions where we're not even paying attention to English, but only working with the symbols. But these abstract exercises will help you in your day-to-day -day business life and other classes in much the same way that the abstracted motions you do in the gymnasium with weights, the treadmill, or the elliptical machine help you to be a more fit and better athlete in your day-to-day -day life. So basically, we will be exercising our logical muscles and improving our logical and critical agility. This will allow you to become a better thinker and knower, 
and therefore a more independent thinker. Ultimately, and what we're all after here, it will allow you to become the life of the party. Now one thing that we're going to be doing a lot in this class is defining our terms. This is so that we can all use the same clear language and communicate well. Sometimes what happens is that we're going to be defining a term that you already know and use frequently because we want a more precise definition for use in this classroom. In other cases, we'll be defining terms that you may not have encountered before and of course we need to get some baseline understanding of what these terms mean so we can put them to work in our class. So here come some definitions, some of which we've already talked about, one of which I think will probably be new to most of you. First of all, a statement. By statement we mean a declarative sentence, a sentence which attempts to state a fact, as opposed to say a question, command, exclamation, or line of poetry or something. Equivalent to the word statement will sometimes say sentence or proposition or claim. By all these terms we mean a statement as defined here. We've already defined argument, but here it is. Again, a finite set of statements, some of which the premises are supposed to support or give reasons for the remaining statement, the conclusion. And here's the definition of logic encapsulated. Logic is the study of one, criteria for distinguishing successful from unsuccessful argument, two, methods for applying those criteria, and three, related properties of statements such as implication, equivalence, logical truth, consistency, and so on. Here's a definition you might not have seen before, truth value. When we say truth value in here, we mean the truth or falsehood of a statement. We might not know whether it's true or false, but we're going to assume that every statement has either the truth value true or the truth value false, and not both. In our intermediate logic course, we examine logics that deviate from this simple assumption. Logics with multiple values, like true, false, and indeterminate, or true as the value 1, false as 0, and numbers ranging between 0 and 1, or logics that examine the ways in which sentences are true, necessarily true, possibly true, necessarily false or impossible. This course is a foundation for those more advanced topics, and so we won't be exploring them here. We'll stick to the basic two-valued system with truth values true, false, and not both. Now here's an example argument. Socrates is mortal, for all humans are mortal, and Socrates is human. Now, if this is in fact an argument, there should be premises and a conclusion. And luckily, we have some indication of where the premises are here. We have a premise indicator word. That little word for tells the reader or the listener that premises are on their way. So for is indicating that all humans are mortal and Socrates is human are the premises. That leaves Socrates as mortal as the conclusion. One question you might ask yourself now, and which we'll get into a little later, is, is this argument any good? For now, take a look at another argument. Given that Socrates is human, Socrates is mortal, since all humans are mortal. Now, the exact same three sentences are used here, but we have slightly different premise indicators. The, word, the sentences occur in different order, but we have given that as a premise indicator to indicate that Socrates is human is a present premise again, and we have since to indicate that all humans are mortal is a premise again. So that again leaves Socrates as mortal as the conclusion. Here's a third argument. All humans are mortal, Socrates is human, therefore Socrates is mortal. Here we have a conclusion indicator in therefore. One interesting question to ask is, how many arguments are on the screen right now? Three or one? I'll leave it up to you to decide. So here we have a number of examples of premise indicators, for, given that, since, and a prototypical example of a conclusion indicator, therefore. Here are some other premise and conclusion indicators. These lists are not exhaustive. Now we had a three or one argument on the screen earlier. In order to avoid the confusion that that might cause, we will often want to put arguments into standard form. To do this, we list the premises, however many there are, draw a line under the premises, and then list the conclusion. 
So for the argument that we've been looking at, it would look like this. All humans are mortal, Socrates is human, and then the conclusion, Socrates is mortal. This is just a neat way to arrange an argument so it's clear what the premises are and what the conclusion is. Another notion of form, and this notion of form will be of utmost importance throughout the course, is that of form and instance. This is easier to illustrate than to say, so let me show you an example. Consider this abstracted argument. All f are g. x is f, therefore x is g. Well, what do the f, x, and g stand for? Well, for f and g, we need some sort of noun phrase or category term, and x is holding the place of a name or proper noun, and if we fill them in properly, putting the same thing in for f, g, and x at each place they appear, we can get the argument that we've already been looking at. Put in humans for f, mortal for g, and Socrates for x, we get the argument on the right-hand side. So the form of that argument is illustrated on the left. If we fill in the f, g, and x slightly differently, we can get a different instance of that form. For example, all monsters are furry, Grover is a monster, therefore Grover is furry. Note that we don't have to use capital letters and the lowercase x in order to indicate the form. We could instead use shapes. For example, a box for f, say a triangle for g, and maybe a circle. So we could read that as all box or triangle. Circle is a box, therefore circle is a triangle. The point is that we're using the shapes, or the letters f, g, and x, just to indicate positions in an argument skeleton. In some examples, we might use blanks, so a straight blank for f, maybe a dot, dot, dot for g, and um, maybe a squiggly underline for the x. We're just indicating places in the skeleton of the argument, places in the form that need to be filled in with particular kinds of words. Most of the logical properties we're going to be interested in this course are a matter of the form of the sentences and arguments that we're looking at. So if we can find a systematic and rigorous way to express that form, then we can get a better handle on the logical properties we're interested in. And in fact, that's one of the main reasons why we develop a symbolic language. The symbolic language will allow us to express form extremely clearly, and it will allow us to develop systematic ways to work with those forms and test them for the properties we're interested in. So form and instance are going to be of utmost importance as we go through the term. This ends Chapter 1, Video 1. In the next video, we'll be discussing deductive criteria for evaluating arguments.